the fourth world of separation. Other council fires were here before ours. The fourth world gurgled and spurted its way into existence as the waters receded and the steam from volcanic tide pools returned to live in the sky nation once more in the form of cloud people. The previous water world had left its mark on the Earth Mother's body, and the cleansing was now complete. The memories of the wannabe chiefs or would-be rulers of the masses had melted into the oblivion of the deep. Below the oceans, new life stirred and filled the vacant remnants of the old civilizations that had gone to live beneath the waves. It was now time for the remaining children of Earth to emerge and take their rightful places among their relations above the soil, to begin again and to become the new foundation of the faithful. Much had been learned about the natural order of our planet during the demise of the water world. Promise was the watchword among those who chose to repopulate the above world, because the Earth Mother promised the tribes of Earth that they would never again live under the domination of one race. The new lessons of humankind were to be riddled with separations even among the clans of individual races, and therefore, no single race would ever be able to agree among themselves enough to exercise control over others. As it was in the beginning of every new world, the promise of the fourth world was the harmony of equality, but the challenge was of separation. Since it was time to begin at a new place on the medicine wheel, the faithful carried this promise of equality as well as the challenge. I watched in wonder as those who emerged with me from the lodges of the subterraneums made plans for the future. Life was once again fertile and abundant. The little people set out to reseed the soil in every hill and valley. The winged ones ate great quantities of seeds and flew across the land depositing fertilized pods to the far reaches of the horizon. As life took hold and new generations of humans and creature beings were born, the new order was set in motion. This new order of learning how to see differences and uniqueness would later deteriorate and become known as the fourth world of separation. The members of planetary family were beginning to understand their separate missions, their distinct species, and how each spoke on the great medicine wheel could interact with all others and still retain its identity. Special talents or medicine in one given area could create a support system, and yet the memory of the destruction of the formerly unified Turtle Island loomed in the shadows as a grim reminder of how medicine for a select few could create disharmony and pain. The remnants of Turtle Island floated above the blue seas of seeming contentment as the new generations effused to look deeply into the watery past, which had left them with the legacy of separateness. Each emerging continent was filled with different traditions, cultures, and ways of speech. Hail Lo Wei An, which had been the unified language of love, was all but forgotten. New languages were taking the place of the primordial tongue, just as all races of the two leggeds were segregating themselves in order to learn more about their individual makeups. I could see the value of specialization, but I dreaded the future wars that could be fought in the name of only one philosophy being holy or correct. As the two legged children of our planetary family began to explore their individual beliefs, the understanding of the concept of great mystery dwindled. All concepts that contained an expansive overview were disappearing, and pieces of the whole idea were taking their places. As time moved steadily forward, the intellects of the human tribe began to conquer and override the unified concepts that had represented oneness in the former worlds. Symbols, originally endowed by great mystery, that had contained the concepts of wholeness were lost when new ideas containing bits and pieces of truth were adopted by all five human races. The individual races of humankind began to form religions based on limiting beliefs, each religion being controlled by wannabe chiefs who basked in the seeming knowledge of the new belief systems. Throughout the passing centuries, spirituality as a way of life and a way of being was replaced with sets of laws based on fear of angry gods. The Stone Tribe dutifully recorded each passing change as the various civilizations peaked out and then collapsed when their lack of equality finally created division from within. As the great mystery was forgotten by most of the two leggeds, many gods were created to take the place of the original source. 
This final and ultimate form of separation from the original source was frightening to the faithful among the planetary family. The medicine stones remembered the council fire of the third world and the prophecies that had spoken of these times in the fourth world when the idea of many gods would lead the human tribe through many difficult lessons. We imparted our memories of these prophecies to those who sought our counsel in order to relieve the troubled hearts of the loyal and trusting two-leggeds. The fourth world was the longest of all the seven worlds and, being the middle world, would be the turning point in the spiritual evolution of humankind. In order to evolve with the two legods and to support their painful growth cycles, the rest of the planetary family would need to endure the harsh lessons taught by ideas of separation. It was not easy in those times of uncertainty and change. At some points in this cycle of change, the creatures of the earth were worshipped as sacred gods by certain religions, and then later those same creature beings were defiled. Some factions chose female humans as gods and others chose male humans, while others still named parts of nature as images of their gods. Each new ruling culture learned from the failures or successes of former civilizations, but in the end, all would-be rulers were eventually ruled by their own greed and their lust for power and control. Wars that killed much of the human population battered and conquered each culture in the name of its own gods or in the name of being the only chosen race. As blood was spilled in sacrifice, poverty and pestilence were the tragic companions that followed the crooked trails of power and glory. The destruction of brotherhood and sisterhood among the two leggeds broke the bonds of the heart. Material possessions were used as symbols of success that could impress some of like mind or intimidate others who saw their own poverty as a symbol of their unworthiness. The jaded senses of the two leggeds lost connection with the beauty found in the natural world and led these confused children of earth down trails filled with demons of their own making. Our hearts were heavy as we watched the burning of their great cities, the destruction of their libraries of knowledge, and the human wreckage left behind in their holy wars. The faithful still kept the eternal flame burning brightly in the below world of inner earth. The sacred hoop of all nations and all life remained intact as it had in all the former worlds, safe in the keeping of the guardians and ancestor spirits. As long as the faithful had life and breath, the sacred hoop of life would remain whole. The members of the planetary family who had lost their true connection to the great mystery projected their own sense of separation into the world by whispering that the sacred hoop was broken and needed to be mended. Little did these broken spirits know that the faithful still stood watch and maintained the connection to all life in order to give the people, who might have briefly lost their faith, a chance to return to Great Mystery's medicine wheel. As time moved like the rolling rivers past the curves and bends of experience, the attitudes of humankind were shaped by their fear and loss of earth connection. Many of the emerging philosophies and religions were kept busy degrading the natural actions and functions of being human. Humans felt it was unsafe to use creativity and self-expression because they feared being too different. The limiting thoughts of separation cast doubt on those who heard a different drummer, making fear and hesitation's victory over the two-leggeds complete. The sacredness of sexual union was defiled with polarizing ideas that created rules concerning how each human, depending upon gender, was allowed to express sensuality or desire. The stricter the rules of various clans and tribes became, the more often sexual crimes were committed. Dogma and morals replaced the inner knowing that had been present among humankind in the former worlds. The fear of being labeled as bad or wanton kept the two-legged females from expressing the natural body rhythms that maintained their connection to the Earth Mother. The male humans began to seek companionship with women who were pure, in the judgmental estimation of their newfound religions. Then these men found that many times, the woman was not able to respond in a natural way due to her fear of her own hidden or suppressed sensuality. The fire medicine of passion and spontaneity was being separated by the ice that flowed through the veins of all humans who feared their feelings or their natural states of physicality. On the other side of that lesson were those who had lost all connection to the spiritual and were controlled by their own lusts and jaded needs for sexual domination. 
The medicine stones, creature beings, and plant people watched the changes with trepidation, feeling with utter dread the confusion of those who wanted to be liked or admired. With their human need to be needed, the seeds of self-doubt had taken hold and the roots of separation had strangled the knowing systems that had once given them the instinct of their rightful places in the physical world. The pain of the two-legged lessons was very difficult to observe as they wandered further and further from the path of beauty. The changes in understanding that would heal the human tribe seemed to be very slow in coming, but the promise of that illumination lived in the prophecy of the last days of the fourth world. I was troubled about the events I had recorded as each new horror of further separation took hold, but my vision was clear and I nurtured the promise of change that could result in enlightenment for the planetary family. Near the end of the fourth world I came into the hands of a spirit I had known before. This part of my personal journey had been revealed to me long ago. I had known that, Alona, my friend from the second world, would cross my path once more. I had seen the vision of our reunion many times throughout the ages and was pleasantly surprised as the events from my visions began to take root in my physical experience. The long green blades of grass gently waved in the wind as I looked into the face of Grandfather Sun. I was admiring a giant dandelion who had just released a few of her feathery seeds into the gentle breeze, when suddenly an enormous human foot kicked me. I heard the yelp of this two-legged as he reached down muttering and then yelled at me for being in his path. In a flash, my vision that contained the prophecy of this moment urged me to scream back as the human began to throw my stone body far from his sight. Don't throw me away, I yelled. I am your friend. The human stood totally still as a curious look crossed his face. He shook his head as if he did not believe his ears. Again I spoke, to make sure that he had no time to doubt what he had heard. Running dear, I am your friend. I have much to share with you. Please, you must take me home and dream with me. Running deer was startled and then amused, and then a look of contentment transformed his features into genuine happiness. All right, stone person, he said. Till take you home with me and we will see just what kind of medicine you have to share. Dragging his leg and moving with great care, he proceeded with me, hobbling toward his cabin on the Cataragus Reservation, and I sighed a sigh of relief. As we made our way slowly to his home, I began to know how I could help this fine runner who had been injured. I could feel running deer's sense of emotional pain, for no longer could he run with the wind or be a source of pride and accomplishment for his people. That night, as I lay nestled in his weather-worn, broad palm underneath his pillow, I entered his dreams and spoke to him through Hail Lo Wei En, the language of love. I told him that I carried a message from the standing people wanted they, who could not walk or run because their roots were deep in the earth mother's breast, understood his frustration and were sending him a new vision of a way in which they could support and help one another. The night was filled with heartfelt messages of oneness, support, and creative vision, and with a prophecy of another kind, as I released my records of these wonders into running deer's mind. The silvery light of Nisa, Grandmother Moon, pierced the threadbare curtains of the cabin and brought the magic of this shared wisdom to light. The great star nation shifted and moved as Mother Earth turned, and then the glory of early dawn graced the cabin walls with Grandfather Sun's golden light. Running Deer lost no time in seeking the company of Moses Shango, the medicine man and wise friend who lived next door. Running Deer told Moses about his dream and how he intended to use the branches of the standing people to assist his tree relations in walking with their two-legged counterparts, and then he approached the curious part of his wonder-filled night. As Running Deer held my rock form in his hand and offered it to Moses, he spoke of a prophecy that would affect the lives of the Shango family. This stone person brought me a dream of a girl child who would be born into your family, to your daughter Blue Flower. The child will be a great teacher among our people and this rock will be her medicine stone. The wisdom she needs to walk this earth will be given to her through the records this stone person carries, he said. Moses Shango took me in his generous palms and held me to his heart. We connected our minds and felt the joy of being in one another's company. 
He looked deeply into the markings etched on my body, felt the medicine I carry, and spoke words of gratitude to the great mystery. Running Deer was pleased that he could be the bearer of good tidings and that his friend would be given the gift of a grandchild. They waxed eloquent as they sat and communicated about the marvelous possibilities the future held in the form of the child to come. Moses's obsidian eyes sparkled as he rocked to and fro in his favorite chair, adjusting his fine felt hat with the beaded band more comfortably over his raven hair while he murmured, It is good, it is good. I held a place of honor in the Shango home as time passed and Blue Flower grew with child. On her birthday the labor began, and she delivered a girl child who was called Yewenode, she whose voice rides the four winds. Her name in English was Twyla, and her destiny was held in the loving care of her grandparents. I watched from my place high on the mantel above the fireplace as the infant grew. I honored her spirit, which was the same spirit as that of my dear Alona of long ago. When Yewenode was three years old, she choked and nearly died. Grandpa Shango saved her life by giving her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Moses left the house when his granddaughter was out of danger and walked out to the small cabin that was his medicine lodge. When Grandpa Shango returned, he called the family together and spoke of the further prophecy that would shape Yewei Nod's life. Her breath is now my breath and she will carry on with the teachings where I leave off, he proudly pronounced. People will come to Yewei Nod from all over the world, and they will beat tracks to her door and climb through windows and over walls to receive the words of wisdom she will gladly share. Her life will contain many hard lessons as well, he sadly continued, for she will be deaf and then she will hear, she will be blinded and then she will see, she will be crippled and then she will walk again. The hush that followed Moses's last words was filled with the individual feelings of each family member as they looked to their hearts for understanding. Little Yewei Node would have much to conquer in her life, and her loving grandparents had to teach her much in order to assist her in meeting those challenges. When she was three, they began to teach her how to listen and retain what she heard, as was done with all native children raised in traditional family environments. In that third year of her life, the lessons progressed until we came to the time for our formal introduction. On that special day, the family living room was the stage for a wondrous event. Many baskets of various sizes were placed on the floor and filled with natural objects representing the different types of medicine given by each relation within the planetary family. I sat with other stone people in a basket, awaiting the appointed time. Other baskets were filled with flowers and herbs from the plant tribe, bones, fur, and claws from the creature tribe, and various medicine objects that would give the grandparents an idea of what special medicine Yewenode carried. The little girl was placed on the floor and allowed to investigate the various baskets until she found the one that drew her attention and held her interest. Yewenode looked over the lot and then came to my basket. My heart soared with eagle when her tiny hand clutched me to her breast and she refused to let go. Like billions of shooting stars, her sparkling eyes showered me with love, and I knew that we were destined to be lifelong friends once more. As the winters passed I watched Yewenode's grandparents teach her the truths of her people. On the back porch, she would be placed on top of apple crates so that her eyes would meet the eyes of her grandparents. This was to teach the little girl that she was equal. She learned that she was worthy of having her own ideas and her own solutions to the questions presented in the lessons she was being taught. The grandparents were allowed to teach her for only four short years before the government would insist that she go to boarding school and learn the ways of a culture had lost its connection to the Earth Mother. Yewenode learned how to listen and pay attention. She was taught many lessons about the cycles of truth. She learned how to use her talents to keep strong in the alien world she would eventually have to enter. One day she took a big spoon from the family kitchen and went to the front of the house to dig herself a hole under the roots of a large tree. On her own, little Yewenode had decided to find her earth connection and to enter the womb of the planetary mother. This hideaway beneath the knotted roots would become her favorite place of retreat in those early years. Grandpa Shango came to see what she was doing and praised her work, for she was using her creativity. 
He knew that it was time to present her with a lesson. Good work, little girl. He smiled. Are you making yourself a place to smell the Earth Mother's rich breath? Ye Wainode answered. Yes, Grandpa. This is the place where I can go inside and feel the Earth all around me. I come here to lie in the leaves and smell the perfume of the Earth Mother. Moses Shango was pleased, and he answered. Ye Wainode, where do you think all that soil you have removed is going to live now? Ye Wainode had not thought about the soil being moved from its sacred space or of having to find it a new home, so she sat and thought. She had to come up with her own solution, as always, in order to develop her reasoning ability. She decided to get a bucket and take the soil she dug up and to go to every other standing person and ask if the tree people would give the displaced earth a new home. This pleased her grandfather, and he smiled on her, showing that she had done well. The approval of her grandparents was not always easy in coming, and she was taught the other side of the lesson in many other instances. The lessons with her grandparents were used to give the little girl strength and the ability to make her own choices without being swayed by the thoughts of others. The officials of the school could be put off only so long. They came to collect Ye Wainode more than once and constantly asked when she was born in order to find out when they could legally take her from her family. Grandpa Shango would look at Grandma Shango and muse. Now let me see. Wasn't she born the year the pump froze, Grandma? This frustrated the school officials more than once, but finally they refused to take any more vague answers to their questions, and Ye Wainode was taken from her loving home. During her absence, Ye Wainode's grandfather dropped his robe and walked into the spirit world. Her tiny heart was shattered by separation once again. Far away from those who loved her, in an alien world that refused to honor the natural ways of earth connection, she cried tears that could have filled a salty sea. Grandpa Shango's breath was now truly her breath, and at nine years old, she began to shoulder the responsibility of walking in his footsteps and carrying the teachings where he left off. I sat in my place of honor high on the mantle and watched the lives of this family of the faithful as many winters passed. I had been Ye Wainode's playmate and friend during her youth, and now she was married with near-grown children of her own. She had passed the experience of deafness and through her faith had regained her hearing, having learned how to hear through rhythm and vibration in a world without sound. Later she had lost her sight, and the blindness had taught her to see with different eyes, which saw through the illusion of the physical world. It was then that she had developed the gift of second sight, and when she had learned how to use that talent, the physical blindness had left. Ye Wainode had been also been crippled from the waist down during the difficult birth of one of her four children, and my heart was nearly broken as I watched her fight to walk again. I marveled at the strength of the human spirit and learned much about my own willingness to continue my own spiritual lessons. The lessons she learned taught her perseverance, positive thinking, and further faith in the Great Mysteries plan. Even though her grandfather's prophecy had spoken of her making it through these difficult lessons, she knew that there was no guarantee if she was not willing to test her own talents and abilities. The day came when she took me from my resting place and we began to record the language of the stones. Each marking on my body was carefully drawn, and I shared the meaning of each symbol in order to make the knowledge available to the children of Earth. It took us many years using hundreds of others from our stone tribe to collect and record the medicine symbols that composed the language of the rock clans. Ye Wainode would sit with each symbol and enter the silence with me as we discerned each concept and meaning. Together we realized that the fourth world of separation was nearing an end and that the ancient tools that would heal the distance between the stone tribe and the human tribe must be made available. The language of love, Hail Lo Wayan, was made of concepts that had been destroyed by the specialization and categorization that had riddled the fourth world with polarities and opposition. I was elated that all of my seven gifts were being used to assist this process of returning the language of my stone tribe to the children of earth to further our common growth and unity. I shared my wisdom and my records with Ye Wei Node during our years together as we explored how we could better assist the human tribe in their growth and spiritual evolution. Many two-leggeds had lost their connections to the natural world, 
These connections, if regained, could restore the understanding of the unified spirit of life cycles and their personal, human roles on the medicine wheel. I shared the records of the fourth world's prophecy with Yewenode one day when the two of us were alone. The time has come for me to share with you the prophecies that were shared at a council fire of the Stone Tribe at the end of the Third World, I began. We are nearing the time when either the Fourth World of Separation will mark a change in the human consciousness on our mother planet, or once again, the Earth Mother will rid herself of those who forget to give praise and thanksgiving for the gifts they receive. The first world was destroyed by fire, the second world by ice, and the third world by water, and the fourth world will be destroyed by polar shift or rotation if necessary. Yewenode nodded as I continued. The purpose of the potential polar shift would be to mark the end of this middle world with a new turning point that would represent the return cycle leading to completion. This shift does not have to occur in our physical world if enough of the members of the faithful come into alignment and harmony. Each part of the planetary family is awaiting the decision of those in the human tribe. The center of every life form has great mystery in it. These vibral cores send out rhythms of harmony or discord. If the human tribe can muster enough of its population who will come into alignment with the rest of the planetary family, the polar shift will be avoided. Yewenode sat silently and then shared her thoughts with me. Giyuk, I can see the awakening of the human children of Earth coming. I feel that they will meet the prophecy's challenge and move past the ideas of limitation, doom, and gloom that have been created in the fourth world. Yewenode's words came true as we watched the winters pass. Each cycle of the seasons brought further proof that different groups among the two Leggeds were joining the faithful who sought world peace through celebration and gratitude. After a time we were told by the Earth Mother that the planetary family had avoided the polar shift through coming together as one. The Medicine Stones know that we are to experience the transition of the Fourth World and that we will not experience the dawning of the Fifth World until around the year 2013 as the two Leggeds reckon time on their calendars. It is during this time that the Earth Mother will begin to wobble and send cataclysms to any areas where the two Leggeds have chosen war, inequality, wrong action, or disharmony. The human decisions for peace have aligned with the Earth Mother's heart. The Stone Tribe sees the cycles move once again as every member of the planetary family feels the wobble that can manifest as life's challenges or difficult lessons. Those who were the ancestor guardians of the Earth tribe knew that the conflict was never outside of themselves but was always within. The fear of having to look at their own inner conflict led many to try to save others who they thought were in peril of losing the only way to enlightenment. This is one of the lies of the world of separation, for nothing is ever apart, all paths are sacred. All life dwells within the eternal flame of great mystery and forever lives within all life forms. The present guardians of the sacred hoop realize that the exciting adventure now unfolding is one of discovery. The task at hand takes further development of every relation's talents. Each relation is being given the opportunity to seek out any conflict within the self and heal it in order to stabilize the wobble that keeps us from personal balance and world harmony. We must still pass through our personal fires or tests of strength and the planetary changes that will prepare us for the fifth world of illumination. Every member of the planetary family will be writing that history, and we of the Stone Tribe will be recording it for the future. Now it is time to look at the prophecy of that future and align ourselves with our common vision of peace in order to fulfill the promises of worlds to come. And so we are now living the final days of the fourth world. So get a grip and you might flow, reverse the great slow bleed I've tried patience but you always want to war This house won't tolerate any more Stop this right away I'll put that down and clean this mess up Our prophets, our legends and myths spoke always of these times That we're going to be going through a powerful uh, changing of eras of um, consciousness here in our planet. And even thousands of years ago, our ancestors were preparing for these times with their prayers, with their ceremonies and their rituals. Now, Around 2012, 2013, within the entry to this new millennia, was marked 
a time of entering into the new times in our planet. There's a beautiful, magical, miraculous process we find ourselves within, entering into a very evolved, awaked state of being from uh, where we have been in the past. Apparently, our ancestors have broken many cosmic laws in the past, thousands of years ago. They had put the life of Pachamama, our mother earth, in danger. So for this reason, the four elements came to awakening and for many years, they were purifying the planet from that civilization that was highly advanced. Oh,